I, there it is. Okay. All right. I can yell loud enough without it. I just, he can't record it that way. Starting next week, we're going to be looking at a, a new sermon series on Samuel. And um, so I would encourage you over the next uh, week and as we're getting into the series to, uh, to be reading the books of, in particular, 1 Samuel, but first and 2 Samuel. And that way you are kind of familiar with the story as we're going through uh, the idea of Samuel and uh, some qualities that tie in to all of us. But today we're finishing up a series, Matters of First Importance, The Return of Jesus. Now, if you came expecting um, a day and time of Jesus' return, here it is. Ready? I've got it for you. I don't know. And I can say that with 100% certainty that none of you sitting out there know either. But we're going to talk about the big picture idea of the return of Jesus. Um, We've been looking at this matters of first importance. Uh, The idea of what Paul talks about, the fact of Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection. Uh, Other places, the ascension, which we looked at last week, and, and the return of Jesus, which culminates the entire process of what God had in store from the beginning to be able to be in his presence perfection for all time I want to start by looking at a passage and we're going to be in the book of Revelation quite a bit this morning Um, but I want to begin by looking at Revelation chapter 1 beginning in verse 7 and I'm reading from the New Living Translation today and, and this is what it says Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the earth will weep because of him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. Now you're going to hear me say today a few things that I hope just don't bother you. Because there's going to be a few times today I'm going to say things like, I have no idea. And it doesn't mean I'm a complete idiot. It just means scripture doesn't give us final details on a lot of things. You're going to hear me say a couple things like, it just doesn't matter. And I hope you're not offended by that. But the truth is, when I get there, what I'm talking about doesn't matter. John, in writing Revelation, gives us an introduction here of something that we talked about last week. Remember Jesus' ascension. And the angels who stood there that day said, you're going to see him come in the same way he went. This is kind of John picking up where Jesus' ascension left off. John is talking about the fact that here he comes. Everyone's going to see him. Those who pierced him are going to see him. Now, how is that going to happen? Ready? I don't know. I don't have to know how. I just know that it's going to happen. Yeah, I think if we were supposed to know how, I think John, guided by the Holy Spirit, would have given us exact details of how scientifically that would happen. But what he's telling us is that Jesus' return is something so prominent, so evident, no one will miss it. Remember Jesus when he came the first time? No one missed it, right? (laughs) No way. Just about everybody missed it. They weren't ready for it. Well, I'm pretty sure most people aren't going to be ready for it when he returns again. Ready for it in the sense of anticipating it today or tomorrow or not even in our lifetime. But we will notice it when it happens. John's words. God is declaring what's going to happen. It's interesting when we begin uh, focusing on matters of first importance, it allows us to understand what matters most about our faith. It helps us understand what matters most in our relationship with God. And if we're focusing on the things that are most important, if we're focusing on the things that deal with eternal salvational issues, 
We don't get sidetracked and caught up in arguments and divisiveness that goes across the country today in churches. We don't become distracted with things that don't really matter. Look at what Peter says. The Apostle Peter, writing to Christians in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3-9, through 9, he says this. First, I want to remind you that in the last days there will be scoffers who will laugh at the truth and do everything evil every evil thing they desire. This will be their argument. Jesus promised to come back, did he? Then where is he? Why, as far back as anyone can remember, everything has remained exactly the same since the world was first created. God made the heavens by the word of his command, and he brought the earth upon water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the world with a mighty flood. And God has also commanded that the heavens and the earth will be consumed by fire on the day of judgment, when ungodly people will perish. But you must not forget, dear friends, that a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise to return, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to perish, so he is giving more time for everyone to repent. Peter is reminding the church, look, his promises are going to be true. He is coming again. Don't worry about when it's going to happen. After all, if you're anticipating, if you're hoping it's going to happen today, in essence, think about God's timing. He's patient. I love how Peter says he's not slow. He, he's patient. Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. We get excited about a lot of things. We want that return to occur. We long for it. Because we know on the other side of this life is eternity in the presence of God. And the destructiveness of this world the pain and the suffering of this world is gone. But it's on Jesus' timetable. He will come when God sends him. And apparently, God's not done with us yet. As we focus on what matters most, everything else gets put in perspective. Instead of being divided about what's not important, As the church, we should rally around what is most important. Too many times, as I said, the church tends to focus on things that salvationally don't matter. That become divisive points that drive people away, that split congregations over some of the silliest things that do more harm to the kingdom than good and I wonder how disappointed God looks down upon his church at times when we argue and we fight over dress over music over buildings I grew up in a congregation that was divided Split. The reason it split arguments primarily over the building and two elders didn't get along and that was proven at one point when they had a fist fight at the communion table. <laughs> you know, it, it may be time at, at some point to say we're going to worship separately. But I still don't think God is pleased with that. The church should be patterned after the first century church. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that in the first century, every one of those people who were part of the kingdom agreed on everything because human nature says they didn't. We know that for a long time in the beginning of the church, the the Jewish citizens were angry that the Gentiles were allowed to worship. And we know that God had a plan for both. We 
We seek to unite believers. Well, that should be our goal. On absolutes. On the essentials of Scripture. But in doing so, we have to allow for differences of opinions on non-essentials and where the Bible is silent. But I will tell you, the second coming is an essential. It is a matter of first importance. It's interesting, in the 260 chapters in the New Testament, there are over 300 references to the return of Christ. It's important. God felt it was important enough to put in his word that many times. Three times in the final chapter of the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I am coming soon. Well, you know, your definition of soon and my definition of soon might be different things. Right? And you know, as a child growing up, when when a parent tells you, well, we're going to go do that pretty soon. (laughs) Yeah, I hear some of you laughing. That may be three weeks from now. Or it may be in five minutes. It's one of those words that has many different meanings. But again, it's about God being patient. Wanting every single person to turn to him. Is that going to happen? I don't believe it is. Scripture tells us that the road is narrow. And only a few find it. But all have a chance. And so God waits patiently. You know, the specifics and the timing of his second coming are matters of interpretation and opinion in many ways. There have been for decades, hundreds of years, people who've claimed to know the certain day and time. It's going to happen June 17th, 1961. Better be ready. Sell everything you got. You're not going to need it. The next day after that appears and you're like, well, you know, God changed his mind and he told me another day. Books have been written. Religions have been built on a specific day. And they're all wrong. Something tells me because God talks about the fact that no one will know the time or day, that if someone guessed it right and what he was going to do, he's going to change the day anyway, just so no one was right. (laughs) I don't know that he works that way, but I'm just saying, he doesn't want Joe walking around heaven going, I called it. Think about it. If you knew the exact moment, would you live your life different? Yeah, we all would, wouldn't we? So the question is, why aren't we living our life different right now? Because we don't know the moment. As I said, much of of the second coming really is in our imagination as far as how it's going to occur. Because even when we read the specific words of what is written, we don't know how that's going to look. He's coming in the clouds. I often wondered, okay, if I'm living in Michigan at the time when it was really running through my head, how is someone in Australia going to see him? Because I can't see Australia. Again, I don't know. It's just going to happen. Because God is God and I'm not. But unfortunately, speculation, false teaching many times, and worldly desires have often overshadowed what really matters about his return. This event should unite us instead for many Christians and in many churches. It becomes a point of division. The first point, the first big word I'm going to throw out, and we're only going to talk about it for a split second and move on because... It's, it's just not worth it. What's it called, Matt? Eschatology. Eschatology. Yeah. How many of you prepared all week to talk about this word? Yeah. Good. I'm glad you didn't. 
It can be a word that in and of itself can be very divisive among people. It basically is the study of the second coming. Well, that shouldn't be a bad thing, right? No, it shouldn't be. If anything should unite the church, it should be the idea of the second coming. And it's one of the most divisive. It includes things like the second coming, the final judgment, the resurrection of the dead, the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. And we're not going to deal with all of those issues this morning. There are several views about Scripture that describe those things. And I could stand up here and tell you what they mean, but I would give, be giving you an opinion as much as anything. Because some of the details aren't 100% clear. But here's what I can tell you about eschatology. The most important thing about it. The only 100% surefire truth about the study of the second coming is this. Be ready. If we unite as Christians, if we unite as the church that God gave to us, it should be around those two words, be ready. So we're going to go past eschatology and go to be ready. Put that, there you go. Because that's what this is about. How many of you remember maybe one of your best vacations? Put your hand up if you remember one of your best vacations. All right. We took vacations all the time when our kids were growing up. Most of our vacations, we came to Tennessee. That became a problem seven years ago when we moved to Tennessee. Because <laughs> we kind of ran out of places to take vacations to. But three years ago, almost three years ago, my dad, some of you met when they were here a few weeks ago, my dad is a huge John Wayne fan and a huge Western fan. And if, if he could do nothing else, he would sit in a chair and watch Westerns 24 hours a day. He always wanted to see out west. So we decided that we would go. It was before my eyes got bad. <clears throat> we decided we would take my dad and my mom on a trip. We had about 12 days and no idea where we were going. Literally. The best vacation I've ever been on. We didn't take the kids. <laughs> That's not why it was the best. I'm just. We got up and we drove from Knoxville to Oklahoma City. Got a hotel room. From that point forward, how we determined where we were going the next day, we pulled out our laptop and we sat in the hotel room going, hmm, what road looks interesting? And we went through Texas and New Mexico and Arizona on back roads the size of 27 or smaller. 127 or smaller. All the way around, all the way back home. <clears throat> it was a great trip because we didn't know what we were going to see the next day. We saw things that maybe we shouldn't see. I don't know. We were in places that maybe we shouldn't have been in. <laughs> down in New Mexico. But it was the anticipation of what was going to happen the next day. We planned it the night before and anticipated it. Now, some of you have been planning trips, big trips, right? Where you, you know you're going to be gone for a while. You, you plan for a long time. Here's what it is about vacations that I think apply to the second coming. The first point is a deciding process. You have to really decide where you're going. If you don't decide, you're not going anywhere. You have to decide. Before Jesus comes back, you have a window of opportunity to decide your final destination. God isn't deciding that for you. Jesus isn't deciding that for you. I find it interesting when people say, well, um, surely God isn't going to send them to hell. No, they're going there on their own. 
because you and I decide for ourselves where we will spend eternity. God has made it very clear. His plan has laid out the two options. You pick, you choose. It's like deal or no deal. Or no, wait, let's make a deal. It's like, let's make a deal, right? Choose door one, two. Well, we don't have a third door in eternity, but we have a door one and two. You pick. It's your choice. The moment Christ returns, however, it's too late to make a choice. When he comes on those clouds and everyone sees him, the doors are already locked. You cannot choose which door to open at that point. You've made your choice. There will be no second opportunity for you to choose. So which do you choose? When Jesus returns, the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So you're going to confess who he is at that moment. But who do you confess who he is now? Do people around you know who you are confessing as your Lord? Are we living a life that says we're ready right now? The second idea with a vacation isn't just the deciding phase. It's the preparation phase or preparing to go. Look what Peter says again in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. It says this, But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and everything in them will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be exposed to judgment. Since everything around us is going to melt away, what holy, godly lives should you be living? You should look forward to that day and hurry it along, the day when God will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised, a world where everyone is right with God. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to live a pure and blameless life and be at peace with God. And remember, the Lord is waiting so that people have time to be saved. Live a pure and blameless life. Why? Because we don't know the moment of that return. This phase of planning for a trip takes intention. You have to actively involve yourself in the preparation stage. If you're planning a vacation where you're going to be gone a long time, maybe overseas, a nice, luxurious trip, you, you plan the details. You don't want to just hope when you get somewhere you have a hotel. Even in our trip to uh, go out west the night before, we at least reserved a hotel somewhere, even if we weren't sure we could make it that far. <laughs> we were prepared as much as we could be. How are you preparing to spend eternity? Getting ready means preparing for that final stop. Peter says it will come like a thief when you least expect it. So that whole eschatology thing which we were passing over isn't really about when will Christ come. The real question is, how will I live while I wait for his return? How are you going to live? Like it's your last moment? Or like you've been told you have years to get your life right? What do you want to be caught doing when Christ returns? The third part of this trip of a vacation idea is the anticipation phase. Anybody have a vacation planned right now for the summer where you know where you're going? Yeah. You guys are going on a cruise, aren't you? JW told me that. A Disney cruise. Really? Man. 
Mickey Mouse, they, they better have pictures with Mickey Mouse ears on. But once you have the details and you know where you're going and everything's planned, it's that anticipation phase. Man, is it ever going to get here? A couple of you I know just finishing up college and high school, and it's kind of that same thought. It's like, is it really ever going to be done? <laughs> you know, there's nothing more satisfying than looking at your calendar, no matter how far away it is, and seeing a vacation written on there, is there? I'm in the process of trying to figure out what to do for vacation this summer, because I told JW we would take one. He's been spending a lot of time on the internet trying to figure out where we should go. <laughs> but I know it's coming. I don't know exactly when, but it's coming. And I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. Folks, we look forward to vacations. We look forward to just time off. We look forward to reunions or anniversaries or birthdays. Are we really looking forward to the return of Christ? We say we do. We especially say that when we're gathered together, right? you feel that way on a Tuesday morning? When things are great, do you feel that way? It's easy to feel that way when life is beating us up. What an awesome day for Jesus' return. I don't care if it's raining, snowing. He's going to return. I want to share two pictures of heaven with you. Not my words, scriptures. The first is found in Revelation chapter 5. It's the picture that John gives us that he sees as Jesus arrives in heaven following his death and resurrection. And this is what it says beginning in verse 1. And I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on the scroll and unroll it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I wept because no one could be found who was worthy to open the scroll and read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has conquered. He is worthy to open the scroll and break its seven seals. I looked and I saw a lamb that had been killed but was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that are sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And as he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were killed, and your blood has ransomed people from God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become God's kingdom and his priests. And they will reign on the earth. See, what happens when we focus on matters that aren't of first importance, we start talking about the unique and weird things in that passage, right? The seals, oh, the horns, the spirits, the 24 elders. If you're offended by this next phrase, I apologize right now, but I won't change my opinion. I don't really care about those things. What I care about is the lamb that was standing in the presence of God who was able to do what no one else could do, and that's redeem me from my sin. That's what matters in that passage. Would I like to know the rest? Oh, you bet I would. <laughs> yeah, but I don't want Hollywood to try and tell me. I don't want another 
human being who thinks he knows to write a book and try and tell me? If God wanted me to know exactly what those things were, don't you think he would have spelled them out? What matters is that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who had been killed, was standing there in the presence, the only one with the ability to break those seals. That's the Savior that we serve. That's the one who died on the cross, who God raised from the dead to redeem us. You have caused them to become God's kingdom and his priests. We're able to serve. We're able to expect the end of this life to result in eternity with God Almighty because of the Lamb of God. Now let's move the story forward. We saw the ascension of Jesus to the throne. Look at Revelation chapter 22, beginning in verse 7. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the prophecy written in this scroll. I, John, am the one who saw and heard all these things. And when I saw and heard these things, I fell down to worship the angel who showed them to me. But again, he said, no, don't worship me. I am a servant of God just like you and your brothers, the prophets, as well as all who obey what is written in this scroll. Worship God. Then he instructed me, Do not seal up the prophetic words you have written, for the time is near. Let the one who is doing wrong continue to do wrong, the one who is vile continue to be vile, the one who is good continue to do good, and the one who is holy continue in holiness. See, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me, to repay all according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so they can enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. I, Jesus have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let each of you who hears them say, come. Let the thirsty ones come. Anyone who wants, let them come and drink the water of life without charge. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the prophetic words of this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words of the prophetic book, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. The return. A lot of things we could debate about and get excited about in the details. Do they matter? Not really. Do they sell books and make movies? Yeah. Are they something to argue and fight about? Absolutely not. Jesus says, I'm coming soon. Are you ready? Put that next slide up. We talked about the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the return. Matters of first importance. You can't have a relationship with God unless you're basing that relationship on that. Because without Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, there is no sacrifice for sin. Without his ascension, the Spirit does not come down to live among us. Without his return, we're never able to enter the throne room of God Almighty. Are you ready? 
Maybe you have already surrendered your life to Christ. You've been immersed for the forgiveness of your sins. I still want you to ask yourself the question, am I ready? Am I living a life that if Jesus returns today, I'm ready? Let's pray. Almighty God, it, um, your plan, your perfect, complete plan sometimes gets so messed up by your people. We've taken what you designed and we twist it to meet our own ideas and our own desires. And Father, as your church, as your church worldwide, I pray that we get past the Past the stuff that just messes us up. And that we hold tight to the truth of what your word says. You're sending your son back. And we better be ready. No second chance. No time to make a decision once he comes. Well, Father, if we truly want to honor you, want to worship you, and want him to be our savior, we, we won't try and wait till the end. So, Father, I pray if decisions need to be made today uh, for the first time in surrendering to you, that those decisions be made. But, Father, maybe there's someone here today who just needs, uh, just needs some extra support and encouragement to, to get back on track. Father, that's why we're here as a family, to encourage and support one another, to build each other up. So that when we leave these walls, we can face a world that wants to tear us down and wants to deny you. Father, help us to never do that. Help us to be strong in our conviction. I thank you for the men and women who are here today who faithfully serve you. Who live in anticipation of the return of Jesus. Father, may we always be ready. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close today, originally we were going to do um, I'll Fly Away. In light of this sermon, though, I...